scientific <coughs> talk uh, about Python and what you can do with Python and some data. So yeah, my name is Henri Hamalainen. I am doctoral candidate at Aalto University. Uh, and I think it's good to put this climate in the beginning that by no means I am a statistician, so I'm uh, also playing with data, but probably not in that sense uh, you could think of. <coughs> and uh, if you have any questions or you want to tweet something, use this hashtag, it's used in that uh, one website. Uh, yeah, well, as I just said, uh, I'm no statistician, but uh, I'm doing things with data. Uh, my research work is about finding um, interesting or serendipitous relations uh, in set of multiple <coughs> genomes uh, data sets. So yeah, I'm doing kind of data mining. But what is data science? This is what abstract definition. Uh, it's kind of science combining traditional computer science, statistics, and visualizations. And why am I talking about that? Well, recent years was on a massive explosion in the data available around the web. Whether it's uh, geospatial data, some data describing some social relations, some customer habits, environmental, governmental uh, data, anything like that, uh, we are actually drowning. Uh, with the data which is available for us. Um, just recently, there was discussion that uh, several organizations in Finland are supposed to open their data. Well, many public organizations currently gather data from different kind of areas, but they keep it closed and Well, there is ain't any reason for that data to be closed. Um, it, yeah, well, <coughs> and uh, well, we have the data, and if you look for different web companies those very big ones, what they are actually doing, they are doing things with data. Like, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, um, their profit comes actually from the data. So applications are actually became a second class citizens. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you some tools, methods, what you can yourself do with the data available for you, and also what you can do to gather some data. This talk is not about these things, like I'm not going to tell you about anything, uh, what you have to know if you have, for example, massive amount of data. So no had up here or anything like that. And also I'm not going to tell you actually anything about the actual algorithms or what's behind these libraries because that's quite off topic. <coughs> Yeah, but I'm hoping to give you some insight uh, what this thing data science is 
although it's not an official definition. It. So this is the rough sketch. I'm going to talk a little bit about data harvesting, which is synonyms for information retrieval, actually. And what then, when you have gathered some data, what you have to do for it before it's machine processable. Data analysis, visualization. And then some, <coughs> some aspects and my own thoughts, what you should do afterwards you have been playing with your data. So I'm going to tell you something about data publishing for making the data available to others. <coughs> but let's begin with this data harvesting. <coughs> so the question is how to retrieve some data for analysis. Because At least I'm not myself, uh, Google or anything like that. I don't have much data available for me just by that. Uh, like um, on my computer. So what should I do to get some data? And this is kind of abstract definition. Uh, <coughs> from where you can get your data. If you happen to be kind of actor which can collect lots of interesting data, like you have your own website, your own social network site, something like that, you can gather all kinds of data about what users are doing in your system. You can get log files, you can't, things like that. Or then you might have some, for example, better sensors and you get your input from those. Or then you just do some manual work to gather your data. But actually the most interesting point is how you can get some data from others so, as said, if you already have the data, uh, retrieving is kind of trivial. Also, there's lots of uh, different kind of data dumps available. Like you can get, for example, a whole collection of Wikipedia articles, for example. And getting those is also quite trivial. Uh, say that, I'm going to completely ignore how you should gather your data, for example, within your own system. That's designing uh, your system so that the data is easily mm, stored. is not so trivial question, but it's again quite off topic. So I'm going to focus on these two, actually this last one. So you can get quite far by using different kind of application program interfaces. Um, using those with Python is quite easy, like there's standard libraries for HTTP APIs and so APIs and quite many of those big players in this field offer also the data through some uh, Python specific libraries which are again what is to use uh, this next question is mostly 
interest of mine, but how many of you uh, actually used any of these uh, these, these Python basic software libraries? Okay. About five, ten percent. Well, there's, and by the way, if you got any opinions or comments, just say it because, yep. Have you been using SUBS? No. Okay. It's quite a softly alternative. Yep. Don't try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, well, no tricks there. Just remember that if you are, for example, using some Python library to reach some data, uh, you have, of course, keep in mind that the service might have some uh, rate limit techniques in action, so don't fall too frequently, or you might get rate limited. And this is actually the most interesting part. I'm going to describe uh, some basic crawling and web scraping techniques next. So I suppose many of you are familiar with web crawling. I think Google does. But now you crawl an example here. <coughs> So the idea is to create an agent <coughs> that uh, autonomously navigates through the web, gathers some documents, gets some links and follows those to retrieve more content. <coughs> and why you would want to use this crawling technique to gather some data? Well, let's say you have some social network site or forum and you want to gather some statistics about that part. Um, that site doesn't allow you to retrieve any ready-made data dumps, then you can, at least you can try to use this technique. And this topic is tightly coupled with web scraping. which means that given that content, you extract some information from those structured documents, you just retrieve. And there's lots of different libraries for Python, uh, for data parsing, lots of XML libraries. You could use, but the problem with those most often is that the actual documents ain't valid XML documents. <coughs> they are quite ugly HTML, and your parser will get lost. Um, just with two alternatives. Cuticle soup already mentioned previous lesson. It's quite nice library for passing small uh, documents, like it's very suitable for web scraping. It's using a regular expression approach, so it's not going to take the country uh, representation. not doing any those traditional approaches usually excellent parsers do it's applying a set of regular expressions to pass tax out of that tax suit um, yeah but it's a bit slow it's pure python and uh, if the xml or html document is like few megabytes will take um, maybe too much time. So this second option is use this LXML library, which actually is just a wrapper for uh, libxmc library. And 
because of that it's of course a lot faster. So just to so you simple example. How to use beautiful soup. different operations to find elements within the document, find find children, find siblings and things like that. And it's very easy to use. But there's also other options. Have any one of you used Scrapey ever? And what are you your opinions about it? No comments. Okay. Uh, to me, uh, it uh, looks a bit too Janois. It's a whole framework, although you can, of course, use some parts of it. Uh, but uh, <coughs> it's maybe a bit too massive for me to uh, use, but there's a whole lot of nice features like with XPath and uh, it makes using different HTTP specific uh, protocol extensions like uh, compression <coughs> and <coughs> offers lot of lots of things so you don't have to talk by yourself. I think some of you might have some opinions about web scraping, whether it's a good thing to do at all, but uh, I use it. These tips and ethics, you should keep in mind in doing it, however. So the first one is uh, very useful use the mobile version of the site because, of course, it's less heavy, uh, means less traffic, means it costs less for the site owner, and at the same time it's much easier for you to pass because that document with it, that soup, it ain't so horrible. And when you are designing your web scraping, if you're using, for example, a browser to retrieve the document, uh, remember not to use any cookies because different sites might render differently. Uh, they might, for example, add some uh, session parameters to URLs if the browser is not supporting cookies. With crawlers, you should usually respect the robots.txt file. Also, you might end up with some troubles if you do uh, get crawling um, too aggressively and the site owner might want to contact you. And I bet it's lots easier for you that if you identify yourself and, for example, tell some email address or URL pointing to a website describing what you are doing so the site owner can contact you and ask, hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm just gathering your data from here. And, well, don't do that. I give you this data dump. In an ideal world, it might work this way. Might also be that you get the lawsuit. But yeah, compression is nice thing. Of course, some web servers might uh, get more loaded. The CPU load <coughs> grow, but and 
when you are harvesting the data uh, usually um, you should download the folk data first and then process it not doing it simultaneously because then if you at some point want to gather something else from that data and you haven't already uh, stored it on your disk or the processing data causes the process to exit or something like that happens you have to start from scratch uh, of course you can do some checkpointing or things like that but um, I myself use this two-stage approach and of course as we just say dumps are available use those if not there's there might be an API and the web scraping is usually the last option and of course it doesn't hurt to ask permission for data gathering and this scraper wiki is quite a nice site if you are familiar with it it allows you to create web scrapers with python or some other languages and those scrapers are running in the cloud service and if the site owner then wants to contact you uh, they will contact you directly, directly to these scraper wiki guys and well then they probably take your scraper offline but it doesn't hurt you Proceed to data cleansing or pre-processing, which means that usually the harvested data comes with lots of different kind of noise. The noise here might mean, for example, the HTML tags of uh, not the actual data you want. You want the content within those tags usually, but the noise might also be that the actual data contains some errors <coughs> how things usually are when working with not so good sensors for example and then again it's quite hard to say whether those values hard values are actually an errors or just some interesting anomaly in the data for example well, um, well the first question is how to detect if the data needs some cleansing and one good figure out easy way is to just plot it using for example this kind of scatter plots and then again who knows if this one is <coughs> an error uh, or just some actual good value which just happens to be for a different but this is quite hard problem and usually <coughs> statisticians spend a whole lot of time uh, doing data gathering and Cleansing the data. And actually, the analysis phase is quite trivial if you have good data. As an output of this step, you should produce the data for analysis in a uh, machine readable form <coughs> it might be just a sequence of some values or in some cases like if you are describing some social relations the network presentation might be nice yes. these are 
And if the alternatives I'm going to use, and well, uh, I usually use well network <coughs> presentation describes like how different entities are related to each other. So I said it's good for, for example, social relations or uh, describing how different web pages are linked to each other. And actually, you can describe a lot of data with this kind of network presentation. offering you some basic tools, statisticians and scientists and other people in the need of efficient tools to process their data using it offers basic linear algebra types and operations. And uh, well why you want to use this, why not just use some Python list, for example. Trivial reason is it's excellent. It uses uh, math libraries um, implemented in C, uh, for example, um, Fortran. That's why it's a little bit faster. The low level implementation in C, for example, uses just uh, fixed length length arrays, so all indexes have the same size, and this is why functions can operate, for example, with the entire array of data at once, doing efficient optimizations that way. And this SkyPy, which builds on top of Mumbai, offers several, several libraries of uh, modules sorry, uh, for different purposes. And after that, there's, there's also add-ons called Skype Kids, which can do like mm -hmm. machine learning, data mining, so other things are used, but there's lots of different and very specific items used together with these. Um, it's map plotlib offers nice plotting functions. Coming, but, but um, to me, this looks much nicer than plots in MATLAB or R. And then, there's, if you put this all together and add the I Python, you get quite nice MATLAB ish environment for data processing and I think the 
the freshman students in our university are going to use if they already aren't uh, use this kind of environment instead of MATLAB because they are learning Python anyway. So if you haven't used IPython, it offers us some uh, helper functions like that competition file system operations. Of course, well, if you are just a Python application programmer, this kind of environment looks uh, maybe quite ugly. For example, this IPython file up uh, imports lots of stuff top level namespace and it's hard to say which are that result names and that kind of problems arise. But as I said uh, quite a lot of information can be described as networks and there's also nice libraries for studying studying these networks and there's these two bigger alternatives I have selected there are others too but uh, I just happen to pick these two this network X and iGraph Network X is a quite Pythonic interface. Um, the implementation <coughs> uses some C libraries, but um, it's mostly Python, at least compared to iGraph, which is again basically just API, which uses uh, iGraph C library underneath. Again, my graph might be a bit faster, but uh, at least in reasonable sized dataset, network X is just fine. What this network network X does? It has a set of different importers and exporters which can take some network presented in some other format inside this network X internal representation and then export it. For example, graph ML or many other forms. describing distances between cities and uh, the API is quite straightforward just instantiate some graph at edges uh, then you can use those <coughs> functions on the library for example to create a path between Turku and Kajani. <coughs> so, um, after you have done some analysis, you might 
want to visualize the results. But, uh, you, of course, most often want to do this visualization after you have collected the initial data before you do any analysis, analysis because uh, this provides you more information about what you should actually analyze about the data. Network X offers just very easy functions. For example, you have to basic call draw function. <coughs> Cross this kind of graph. There are some other layouts. This is the basic one. Of course, you can use all these like graphics, which it offers Python interface for graphics libraries. At least this used to be the way I draw graphs before uh, I start to use Python. And actually, so it might be that Network X offers well, okay, let's forget this. It might be that Network X allows you to use Y graphics to its API. I'm not sure. <coughs> but of course, you can use this already mentioned Matplotlib. It offers. traditional data plotting functions and recently Matplotlib was mm -hmm. also integrated with this plot greedy and it allows you to plot um, data in multiple dimensions with multiple text and there's other option which is uh, very good if you can compare it, compile it for your system this um, Maya V which is again uh, Python API for DTK, which is a uh, visualization to Git, and allows you to plot uh, scientific visualizations in 3D. After you have played with your data, what should you do next? This uh, last section is here because I hope that um, many of you, after collecting your data, will also make it available for everyone else to use. Cetan data uh, should be available for everyone, like uh, public organizations usually should do that. Other just provide the data, hoping it will be beneficial for others, or that it will create more value for the data if other people are using it too. And, uh, This topic <coughs> is currently quite hot and people are actually organizations are talking quite much about what they should do, should they open a day, should, should they get it closed. And this, this 
kind of variation, sen of Python, sen of Delta. Which basically basically describes some uh, opinions and the last part is important usually after you have collected some data you just uh, store it and think <coughs> that okay I'm going to publish it later I just have to polish this one and maybe Correct this part, and then, um, then you forget the data. So publish often and publish soon. Things that help others to use your data. First thing is uh, use some convenient format. I just said that you should publish often and soon. That's okay, but if you wish to take the next step, use some nice format for your data. There's lots of alternatives and you know, easy to use. Most Of course, are uh, already in the standard library. Um, if not available, um, quite easy to use. The last slides I'm going to represent how you can share your data with LDF. stands for Resource Description Framework and although there's this framework in this title, it's actually quite trivial to begin with. LDF allows you to model data coming from different sources in a way that it combines quite nicely. Models it like mm, the form of subject, predicate, object, tables. So, for example, well, these tables are kind of facts, and for example, here, this kind of fact, by config 2011, is organized into this point field like uh, subject, predicate. And after you have lots of those, it looks like this. This is actual example describing uh, an area nearby here. There's some textual content and uh, coordinate other information cut and you can see that the I'm not going to lecture you much of this but the triples are so that <coughs> the actual subject describing the unique ID for this place is here and for example here credit that is this description which has object Either of value. Why you should use this kind of format for your data is that there uh, are query languages like SparkQL. Well. 
this allows you to query the data. And uh, here we use this query language provided by SparkQL wrapper library. <coughs> and we query libraries in Helsinki located within one kilometer radius from the city center. Um, although the query looks quite ugly, the actual usage is quite easy. Um, if you wish to know more about this, you want to play around. You can use, for example, an endpoint you can use. There's lots of other live endpoints you can use also just charts. And just some data sources. This provides you LDF. C can also provide you many other data sets. And, uh, these are all in LDF, but uh, of course, lots of different data sets are available in other formats too. And in the future, we are going to see many more data sets to be open. If you get a question, would you repeat it for the stream? Mm, sorry? If you get a question from the audience, could you please repeat it for the recording? Yeah, okay. So, the question is if this graph is describing a chain network. No, it's not. Have you tried the Python dash graph package for graphs? Yeah, that's that's basically providing you data structures to hold LDF data, and it also offers you SparkQL search functionality in with uh, LDF. Maybe it's that it's a bit slow, I think. If and the SparkQL. Yeah, things are a bit better now, but uh, mm, yeah, this SparkQL wrapper is basically providing you just functions and types to use like SparkQL endpoints. Other questions? Just one comment about the data sharing. There is also like a bad example that uh, what may happen if, if you share data. So, so uh, one, one is this AOL, AOL, AOL case. So uh, they did uh, share data about uh, their users, the user ID and Google yeah. search, text and link clicked. And it turned out within a couple of hours that it's possible to uh, plus it find the individuals yeah. between, behind those IDs. So, so easily you, you expose, expose people's privacy. Yeah, that's, 
That's a big yes. research question. Yeah. At least add it to 10 walls. <laughs> respect individual privacy. Yeah, I think it even might be there, but I just have <laughs> trouble lines. <laughs> Are you, are you aware about this case? Yeah, there's actually lots of uh, similar cases, like um, researchers in MIT demonstrate how to classify um, people, for example, by their Facebook profile and Facebook friend connections, and they got quite personal information, uh, information about those results, but um, yeah, this data anonymization is a critical question, of course. And, uh, but then again, it's usually easier to ask forgiveness than ask permission. So <coughs> you should not be too cautious about publishing your data. Good question. I haven't used Python tree myself very much. I'm what 100% sure is at the moment uh, or ain't compatible with Python tree most likely. There are some problems. Because you know what scientific code usually tends to be, even though all these lips and so scientific about Yep. Do you have any experience with Jive and uh, Mahout? Jonathan? How uh, do you use Jive and uh, these models and Mahout is all this machine learning and which is great stuff in Java? In both uh, no. Is, uh, So the question was about Sinu Mahut, which is some nice tool that you probably should be aware of. I would like to thank you on behalf of the organizers. And I have a surprise gift for you. This is a local uh, Brazilian coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you drink a lot of coffee in your coding session. So Thanks. Please enjoy. And, uh, I have some information about lunch. You all are getting. Are we about? 